Hello, my name is Patrick McGraw, and I want to welcome you to the Royal Society of Canada COVID-19 and Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities panel. We have a very fine lineup today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Annette Majmer. She's a researcher at McGill University, and Dr. Majmer's research focuses on early identification strategies and the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that influence outcome in children and youth with that or high risk for brain-based developmental disorders. Dr. Yona Lunsky is a senior scientist and director of the Adult Neurodevelopmental and Geriatric Psychiatry Division and the Healthcare Access and Research and Developmental Disabilities Program at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Lunsky's research focuses on the mental and physical health of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Krista Carr is the Executive Vice President of Inclusion Canada, and Krista is a longtime advocate in the inclusion movement. She is the Executive Vice President, CEO of Inclusion Canada, one of Canada's 10 largest charitable organizations. She has over 25 years of experience in the nonprofit sector as a champion of inclusion. In addition to her extensive work portfolio, Krista sits on a number of provincial and national disability-related boards and committees, including the Minister's Disability Advisory Group. Lena Faust is a member of the National Youth Advisory Panel of the Child Bright Network and was involved in the Child Bright advocacy efforts around the impacts of COVID-19 on individuals with disabilities. And she's currently a PhD student in epidemiology at McGill University. And finally, Victor Pera is a self-advocate from Toronto, an advisor at the mm. Israeli Adult Neurodevelopmental <coughs> Center at CAMH. He's an actor, an athlete at the Special Olympics, and a troublemaker. And we're <laughs> going to start with um, Annette, um, and who will present some overview slides. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'd like to provide a short overview of our policy briefing on the impact of COVID-19 for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'd first like to acknowledge our co-authors who provided quite diverse expertise in this area. And especially we are very grateful to our self-advocates who were individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, that were part of different organizations. Um, so we're very grateful for their input on the very on on the themes that uh, were selected and on uh, feedback on our recommendations. So this policy briefing is bilingual and provides an executive summary, a full report, as well as an accessible version of the briefing. There are eight thematic areas that we identified and. These refer to different life situations that are impacted by COVID-19. So in this report, we describe each theme, um, the current challenges experienced by individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities, and the evidence on the impacts of COVID-19 in these areas, usually exacerbating existing problems and policy recommendations for each of these areas. With respect to the accessible version, the idea is to, to reduce barriers to comprehension. Um, and so this is just an example of um, how the, access, the accessible version looks. So we see here um, that there is an infographic and a description that is easy to understand to enhance accessibility. So these are just three examples of recommendations. So I'd like to go through the, the eight areas very quickly, just to give you a sense of the challenges experienced and some of the recommendations put forward. So our first uh, theme is on the health risks associated with COVID-19 for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So the evidence strongly suggests that they are at higher risk for um, complications, uh, hospitalizations, and mortality um, if infected. And so it is important that we try to reduce risks um, using a disability inclusive approach. So our first recommendation is really about prioritizing persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities for vaccination, something that was slow for uptake and quite variable across the provinces. And this uh, is important that they are prioritized given their heightened susceptibility. And this remains important for booster, uh, boosters as well as the vaccination. 
The second recommendation is to ensure that health information provided to the public adheres to national accessibility standards to enhance comprehension. So our second theme was access to healthcare that's not COVID related. And this is an area of uh, importance because all the health and social services provided to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities are deemed essential and, and not something that they, it's something they must have, not would like to have. So we wanna be sure that um, they have ongoing access to these essential services, whether they're in hospitals, rehab centers, or community or home care. So our first recommendation is to deter designate their services as essential and make sure that they are provided using appropriate healthcare accommodations. Um, telehealth had become an important avenue for access to services, but they must be adapted to make sure they're accessible for all individuals, whether it's using um, different adaptations for physical, intellectual, auditory, or visual deficits. There's also need for mental health services as this, as this population and their families are disproportionately impacted by the, by the pandemic and many require mental health supports. The third theme relates to participation in leisure and recreational activities and community inclusion. And this group already experiences important barriers to accessing different leisure and community-based activities. So it's essential that we try to minimize any further barriers associated with the pandemic. There are many adapted and inclusive community programs, but often they're not well known to uh, individuals with developmental and uh, intellectual disabilities. So that's something to address, but also to recognize where the gaps are in certain communities. So a data collection strategy is an important recommendation to be sure we're aware of what is already available that is adapted and inclusive in communities, but also to provide support guides so that people become more aware of what's available. And this would include virtual programs during the pandemic. Um, finally, to allocate funding for community-based initiatives to enhance access to uh, participate in community-based activities such as adapted playgrounds or providing training in, in community health cent community centers. The fourth theme relates to inclusive education and individuals with the, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities have a right to quality education in their local communities. So inequities that already existed were exacerbated and therefore supports are very much needed for students and families, but also for the teachers and the schools in terms of addressing some of these inequities to inclusive education. So therefore recommendations involve um, allocation of mo appropriate modifications, accommodations and supports in the various schools and importance of looking at the impacts of the pandemic on learning, not only for the population at large, but more specifically to this high-risk population. The fifth area, um, it's important to recognize that income and employment has also impacted the, not only the population at large, but there were, there were income shocks uh, experienced by individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and they are equally deserving of income support programs. It's important that we develop a national disability income benefit um, to guarantee in a minimum income for Canadians with disabilities, an effort uh, that Minister Qualtro is working hard on and as well as others. Um, we want to make sure there are disability inclusive uh, income supports to address additional costs that are experienced by this population of interest. It's also very important that we provide emergency caregiver benefits as caregivers may have had to take leave, either partial or full-time leave in order to care for um, family members uh, with intellectual and developmental disability. <clears throat> Um, going, looking into the future, looking at accessible employment support options will be very important to ensure employment and productivity. <clears throat> the sixth area is caregiver support and the health of individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities is very much tied to the health 
of their caregivers. The burden of caregivers, caregivers has significantly increased during the pandemic, and therefore we need to pay close attention to supports uh, to alleviate burden and minimize strain. So an important recommendation that relates to this is ensuring that any residential or congregate care settings meet long-term care standards and allow unrestricted access of caregivers um, to, to visit individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Three previous recommendations to allocate mental health services, provide accessible uh, resource guides and provide emergency caregiver benefits are all relevant to supporting caregivers. The seventh theme relates to housing and congregate care. And it's quite clear that the type of residents um, that individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities live in very much um, impacts their risk for infection and complications. So therefore preventative measures are very much needed to uh, minimize that risk. An important recommendation is to collect and data and provide surveillance for people with dis intellectual developmental disabilities about prevalence of infection and outcomes. Uh, this is something that we have uh, urgently need to really be able to uh, have the appropriate policy responses. And also to make sure that safe and affordable housing options remain uh, a priority um, during the pandemic and beyond. Previous recommendations on mental health services and meeting uh, long-term care standards and access of essential family members are also relevant to this theme. And finally, population level approaches to health is a, the, uh, an important area. There is a lack of population level data in general about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, both children and adults, but then more specifically about uh, impacts of COVID-19. Therefore, surveillance data is urgently needed to uh, ensure that we uh, support uh, this population optimally in terms of their health and well-being. So collecting uh, surveillance data, as mentioned before, is important. But finally, ensuring um, with respect to hospital triage for protocols, very important for health, equitable and ethical uh, processes are, uh, are urgently needed and based on human rights principles. And in more specifically, healthcare providers um, who do triage should be trained to reduce the risk of discriminatory bias. So in summary, children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities already feel undervalued and ignored and not on the radar in terms of health and health care. There is considerable evidence that, um, that this population is, has had a disproportionate impact of the pandemic uh, and its restrictions that are uh, associated with it. Therefore, a disability inclusive approach to policy response is urgently needed, listening to the voices of the individuals and prioritizing their needs. And in particular, the recommendations remain relevant even after the pandemic so that we can promote a more inclusive, accessible and sustainable Canada for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, Perhaps we can now turn to Yona. Thanks so much, Annette, for summarizing uh, such a such a endeavor. I have to say, someone working on the endeavor. I, I come to this wearing a couple of hats. Like like Annette, I'm a scientist in the field, uh, working in Toronto, um, focusing more on adults. Um, but I also have been sort of thrown into uh, you know, trying to give almost em emergent or emergency kinds of clinical responses. I didn't work in a hospital emergency room. I wasn't treating patients, but dealing with some of the mental health crises that were going on for people during this time, and also trying to help everyone unpack so much inaccessible inac information when it was so urgently needed to know, well, what do we do? What does this mean? What's going on in this part of the country? What's going on in that part of the country? And just hearing kind of stories after stories from working with um, individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities and from families. 
um, and agencies who really were not uh, properly equipped, as you highlighted before this started, to deal with everything that happened in the pandemic. Um, but the other hat that I wear is as a sibling of someone with, a, with an intellectual disability, uh, living in a residential um, supported setting um, who, you know, while we all, I think, suffered um, in so many ways over the last however many months, you know, in her situation and in the situation of many other people, which we tried to highlight in the, in the comments that you mentioned, Annette, about um, living in, you know, more congregate type settings or group living settings, even if that setting only had, you know, four or five people or three or four people, um, the same kinds of urgent rules applied in terms of making sure that people were safe from getting COVID, which also had uh, several, um, you know, really very difficult implications for them, um, you know, not being uh, hugged, you know, and not seeing their loved ones for well over a year. Um, and sort of the the long term impacts of that, which I think we're still we're still experiencing, even though um, you know those those restrictions have finally um, eased. So I kind of I wear all those hats now, and I think I wore all those hats when we were actually working on the report. And there were several uh, scientists um, from from around the country who also wore a family caregiver hat who were involved in the effort. And then we also um, had um, a parent on our panel who was just sort of giving her lived experience as a caregiver. And we were engaging um, with um, self-advocates around their experience kind of as we went. And I think that was really important because, you know, usually we don't, we don't usually study things and report on things that are sort of happening so rapidly while we're still studying them. Uh, and so intensely, you know, it was a, probably the most emotional report I've worked on. Um, there are a few things I'm, I'm really proud of that we did in putting the report together and you, you highlighted some of them, Annette. But I also wanted to mention that typically when we speak about what's going on with this population of individuals, we tend to have you know, our own silos. So some of us look at health, some of us look at education, some of us look at you know, poverty, employment. Um, we looked at all these things together and we also looked at them across ages. So there were many um, people on our, on our panel who wrote this report who focused more on children. Uh, and then there were some of us who focused more on adults and some of the issues are the same, uh, but then there were some sort of unique um, things that came up for the different groups. We were actually educating each other while we were rapidly trying to put the information together. I think that was really important. Um, we also, to make sure we were capturing, you know, what was going on for people who were living, what was happening. We made sure that we spoke with people to share the recommendations with them and get their input on it. And then we tried to integrate where we could their quotes and their words about the experience into the report itself. You know, one of the sort of the mantras that we used in the report, nothing about us without us is really important. Um, and I think we could even do much more than we did, but we at least tried, I think, to, to hear from individuals and to make sure that their words were reflected uh, in, in what we put on paper. And I think that's why, thanks for sharing this, Annette, the, um, the easy read document that accompanied the, the Royal Society um, document that's online. I think that's probably the first easy read we've put out through the Royal Society of Canada. Um, and, and we, you know, we thought it'd be kind of wrong for us to talk about how inaccessible information was and make these, you know, very academic, very wordy, fancy um, recommendations of what needs to happen without giving thought to how we actually say that to the people that we're talking about. So we did take the extra time, I think, to figure out what do these recommendations mean? Do they resonate with you? How do we explain them? How do we show them? Uh, at least illustrating to people that when we say something important, we need to make sure that it is heard by everyone if we really think it's that important. So those are things I think we did that were good. Um, but there are a lot of things I think that, that we haven't been able to do with the report yet. And I just want to comment on that briefly, if I can. Um, I think that we... Um, we haven't seen as much action, you know, in most of these recommendations, I think, as we would like. Um, as you mentioned, Annette, that the problems aren't over. They're going to continue beyond the pandemic. Um, and we need to uh, we need to stay with this because actually the population that was underserved and struggling before this happened is now that much worse. And I actually don't know. None of us know yet how long it will take to sort of recoup um, the mental health losses to address you know, um, poverty and issues that have become even worse. People who were employed, who are no longer working now, have lost some of those skills and we don't know how they're necessarily all gonna get back to work. 
people who were included in their community activities haven't been doing that now for some time. Uh, and, and we don't know again how easily or how much support they're gonna need to return to that baseline, which wasn't great. So I think the investment we need to think about moving forward is so important. And um, the importance of you know, easy to access shared data telling us what's going on you know, um, is, is so important and maybe is one reason why I think the gaps were there and it took us a while to come together to highlight what was going on. So we really need to be responsible for every citizen, I think, in our country and have this kind of information that shows us who needs support the most and also that shows us that some of the things we're working on um, that lead to differences actually are making a difference. So I guess my last comment that I wanna make is just highlighting that um, we don't really know what's ahead of us, but we certainly know what the problems are. Um, and uh, they're not surprises, at least they're not to anyone who works or who lives um, their lives in this field. Um, but what we are dealing with right now is uh, you know, 18 months of um, uncertainty, of depletion, and a fragility, I think, of people who are still quite anxious and afraid of what's gonna happen next. Um, and I think we need to do everything we can to continue to support research in this area, but more importantly, to make sure that we're actually taking actions on the clear recommendations that are articulated in this report to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iona. Uh, perhaps we can now turn to Krista. Sure, thanks, Patrick. Um, so I, I would first say, I guess, that I how much I really appreciate uh, the report and the work that was done on the report. I'm personally not an academic. Um, I'm a bit of a grassroots grassroots gal. I, uh, I've been in this field for 25 years, so came to it right out of university. And I've spent 21 of those 25 years uh, working as a provincial ED of one of our member associations and really um, a lot of time at the kitchen tables of families uh, and individuals who uh, are so impacted by everything that happens around them. So as we said, Inclusion Canada is a national organization that has 13 provincial territorial associations and 300 local associations, over 40,000 members. And so what I'm here to talk about today is what I know about the lived experience of people with an intellectual or developmental disabilities and their families and how that lines up with the report. Um, time to be counted, COVID-19 and intellectual and developmental disability. And to try to give some concrete examples of the profound effects of COVID on this population and why urgent action is needed. And, and I could talk all day about this and because this is what I live um, and I, I will try really hard not to do that. So I, I won't say everything I'd love to say, um, but I would say how much I appreciate uh, the report because it's, it's, it's academics, it's researchers, it's science, it's people who prepare the information, do the digging, collect the data, you know, that really help advocates on the front lines, like myself and so many others, uh, to sort of, as I like to call it, make the snowballs that we then get to throw in terms of trying to, to make change and convince policymakers that things need to happen differently. So first off, just a little bit of talk about the health section of this and certainly appreciate the data up front in the report that synthesizes the clear evidence about the increased health risk to people with an intellectual or developmental disability. And for a while, so little of this data was, was available in Canada because we just weren't collecting it. Um, but I think it's pretty clear from the report that there's, we, we know about the increased uh, risk of COVID to people with an intellectual or developmental disabilities. Yet, we have failed to prioritize people with intellectual or developmental disabilities, who I'm gonna just start to say IDD, just for short, um, for vaccinations. We've, we've failed to provide the public health information to this po population in the accessible formats. And we failed to provide adequate accommodations for them to access va vaccines. Now, there are pockets of good practice across the country. There are places and people and who have done some really great stuff. But generally speaking, 
we have failed miserably in this regard. And why is that? Um, and now we're about to roll boosters out and we're seeing the exact same types of prioritization, et cetera, that we saw for, for vaccination. So we haven't really implemented any of our learnings there. And we talk about in the report, the mental health effects of COVID on this population. We know that before COVID, 40% of people with IDD also have a co-occurring mental health issue. And there's already a lack of access to mental health services starting right at diagnosis. So that was prevalent. It was a pervasive problem in Canada right or before COVID ever came. And the pandemic has significantly exacerbated that issue. If I give, I live, personally live in, in the province of New Brunswick, we have absolutely zero um, specialists who can even diagnose adequately or appropriately diagnose someone who has an intellectual or developmental disability and also a mental health problem. We turn people away from our mental health systems. We just say, I'm sorry, we, we don't do that here. Um, there's, there are no, there's nowhere for people to go to get the supports they need and they end up heavily medicated and, and, and they're just really, and not getting the support that they require uh, or access to any kind of therapies or any, any other types of supports. And that was, be, that was before it's been made a million times worse by the effects of COVID. So what now, what are we going to do to address this? We talk about telehealth in the report. The report talks about telehealth. And, and there are some, there have been some good things about telehealth that are, are talked about as well in the report. But in order to access telehealth services, you have to have access to technology. You have to have access to internet. And you have to often, if you're a person with an intellectual or developmental disability, have access to assistance or support to get online to access services online, to, to be connected online. And, you know, when, you, when we think about the poverty rates of people with an intellectual or developmental disability and the situations they're living in, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, many, many, many have no access to technology. They don't have access to internet because they can't afford it. Um, and so, that's a real problem. And just, I like to give some concrete kind of bring down to earth examples. And I have millions of them, it feels like, but you know, one mom, you know, that we were connected to during the pandemic, three kids, um, two with a, with a disability, one without would drive 20 minutes to a half an hour every day to sit in the parking lot outside, outside her mother's apartment building so that she could connect into Wi-Fi because they couldn't afford Wi-Fi service. And remember, places where people went to get free internet service like libraries, et cetera, all closed during the pandemic. And so would sit in a parking lot with three children trying to learn online every day um, so they could access school. And I guess in other, as well, in terms of healthcare, I would really want, I really want to talk about the very real ableism and discrimination that exists in the healthcare system. This has been bubbling under the surface uh, forever, uh, it seems, but it's really had a light shone on it in this pandemic uh, for this population. We've seen everything from discriminatory triage protocols being put into place across the country, particularly in provinces where you know, medical resources got very, very, very tight. Um, deciding whose lives we feel are worth living and hence worth saving. And I can guarantee you that, the pe that people with an intellectual or developmental disability were not on the priority list for the ventilator. And that is a real problem. People showing up at hospitals for non-COVID related issues during the pandemic and immediately being asked if they had a DNR, do not resuscitate, uh, or a MAID agreement, medical assistance in dying agreement in place. Hospital visitation policy, and that didn't happen for the regular population. Ho hospital visitation policies that left people who needed support to communicate, 
who needed support to understand information, who needed support, who were people who understood their communication, who needed advocacy, who were left alone in hospitals with no support whatsoever. If you, we wanna talk about uh, inclusive education and, and the report talks a lot about that as well. The system had no idea how to support kids with disabilities in online learning. Families often didn't have access to the technology or the Wi-Fi, as I mentioned before. Parents were trying to work from home and support children to learn from home, and particularly with children with intellectual or developmental disabilities became their de facto teachers during this period of time, had to take time, many mothers that had to take uh, at leaves of absences from their jobs. Um, and we saw some provinces like Alberta, for example, who actually laid off all of the, cut the funding to all the educational assistance during the pandemic. So families didn't even have access to support from their educational assistance for the online learning. Um, the focus, if any, was on the quote unquote regular kids. And the, the structure was gone, routines were disrupted. Uh, for kids who often who have an intellectual or developmental disability who thrive on routine and structure. And that makes behaviors emerge and exacerbates and puts families under extreme duress. Now we're looking at issues around, we have kids back in school for the most part in a lot of places, but we have no, in many provinces, there's no been no implementation of vaccine mandates in schools for teachers, for staff, for, for other places. And it, it makes sending kids who are immune compromised in any way to school still not accessible and supports are not in place to deal with these issues. The report talks about income and employment. Well, people with intellectual or developmental disabilities were the first to lose their jobs during the pandemic. Um, we saw that over and over and over. And Many were afraid as well to, you know, if they're at higher risk for COVID or for bad implications of COVID. And so they're worried about working. They're worried about going back to work now. And while work from home is great um, for some people with disabilities, it works really well. Often for people of an intellectual or developmental disabilities, it doesn't work as well. This is not everybody but often it doesn't work as well uh, because again, the social isolation that comes with that and thinking about one example of a family who, you know, young man with Down syndrome has his own condo, has a job, has relationships, has all kinds of things. When COVID hit and was forced to work from home and all those social relationships are also cut off, not just at work, but with other people coming in and out, and the isolation and the mental health impact of that made it so that he had to sell um, his condo. They're looking at selling the condo and moving in with family, not because he isn't completely capable and happy living on his own, but because the effects of the isolation of the pandemic and having to work from home and be alone all the time have had such an impact. We saw, you know, the people that had an intellectual developmental disability that were eligible for CERB, uh, if they tried to draw it to help support their income during the um, pandemic and all the additional costs they had, it was often clawed back in almost every single province uh, except BC. And uh, there were some provinces that let people keep a little tiny bit of it it was all clawed back if they were receiving provincial income assistance benefits or uh, disability. And so I get to poverty levels and I guess I would say, we know that there are 70% of adults who live outside the family home who have an intellectual or developmental disability live in poverty. These individuals are already struggling to survive day to day and month to month. And during the pandemic services people relied on like food banks for food, public libraries for Wi-Fi, and computer access were shuttered the cost of groceries escalated, the cost of PPE, people paying for delivery of food they already struggled to afford to buy, lack of access to transportation because it was, wasn't safe to travel in public transit during the pandemic. All of these things just exacerbated the poverty levels 
to unsustainable levels. The cost of everything has gone up during this pandemic and people who already couldn't afford to buy things are even worse off now than they were before. And so um, when we talk about housing, um, we know that people that were, that were living outside of congregate settings fared better overall during this pandemic than people who are living in congregate settings. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. And the report talks about this as well. Uh, people were far more vulnerable in congregate settings. They were also way more isolated. And we, we hear, hear a lot about the, the outbreaks. We also know that people who were living on their own faced lots of challenges as well. Loss of supports coming in and out of their home. People, they had support staff coming in and out that were working with a variety of other people. And there's just all kinds of issues that emerged around that. But what did we hear about? What we heard about was the seniors because everybody's grandmother and everybody's father or mother and whatever were affected about the atrocious circumstances that we saw in long-term care during this pandemic. And there was public outrage. What we didn't hear about were all the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in those same situations in many, in many circumstances under way worse conditions uh, that were, were facing the same challenges, no public outcry. And now we, we think we can make long-term care better. Um, we'll staff it better. We'll make it look better. We'll monitor it more. But it doesn't change the underlying fundamental issues. And so just to wrap up, I guess, We've seen the impacts, the report gives us the snowballs, as I said, but where's the action? Um, the theme through all of this is a devaluation of lives. Pandemic's been hard on everybody in this country. There isn't anybody that hasn't been affected in some way by it. But this group of people has been, I will go to my grave saying, far more disproportionately impacted. And a lot of it was is, is because of the devaluation of the lives of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Where's the outrage? Where is, where is the action? Where to from here? And, you know, we've seen, you know, Minister Qualtro announced the Disability Inclusion Action Plan, which will see the establishment of a Canada Disability Benefit. Uh, there's a pillar on disability inclusive spaces and what does that look like and how do we ensure uh, inclusion across community, uh, an employment strategy, uh, national employment strategy, and modernizing federal programs and services and fixing programs like the DTC. We have to hope, we have to work really, really hard to make sure that those things get implemented, absolutely. But where are we going to and how are we going to address the medical ableism in healthcare? How are we and when are we going to expand access to caregiver benefits? How and when are we going to use reports like the one the Royal Society of Canada just completed and the others that are out there and the voices of the individuals themselves who have an intellectual or developmental disability and their families and their support networks when are we going to listen and take some real action and make some real change? And I guess that's the big question for me at the end of the day. Thank you very much, Krista. It certainly is time to be counted. Our next speaker is Lena. Uh, Lena? Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, and just to introduce myself, um, I'm on the National Youth Advisory Panel of the um, ENYAP, um, sorry, on, of the National Youth Advisory Panel of Childbright, um, which is a uh, research network focusing on patient engagement in research on brain-based disabilities. Um, and I have mild cerebral palsy, which is how I got um, involved in, in Childbright um, with Annette. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in writing this report. Um, and as someone with a brain-based disability, this is um, a report that's very important to me. And um, I'm very glad that it's been uh, published and that um, the voices of people with lived experiences are um, have been taken into account in it. 
Um, and um, yeah, so I just want to talk about a few sort of key things um, to me when I think about the impacts of COVID-19 on people with um, brain-based disabilities. So first of all, um, at the beginning, there was no data on, um, on risks for people, um, so COVID-19 associated risks for people with um, brain-based disabilities. Um, and as an epidemiology student, um, as my day job, this was uh, sort of, this lack of data was just um, an issue for me personally. Um, and I was just, um, when we were asked um, what we were asked by, as our, um, through our work with Childbright, we were asked um, as, you know, someone with lived experiences, what are some things that you want to know right now during this pandemic? Um, or what are, what is some information that would be useful to you? And I was like, I would like to have some data on um, whether, you know, I am more at risk of COVID or whether my peers um, in, on the National Youth Advisory Panel um, are more at risk and what the outcomes are for, um, for people um, with intellectual and uh, developmental disabilities when, when they have COVID. Um, so this kind of led to um, a rapid review on the risks of COVID-19 in people with, um, in children with um, brain-based disabilities. Um, but it really just highlights the fact that we need to be more cognizant of um, identifying vulnerable groups early in, um, in a crisis. Um, so we have now been added as a risk group, um, but this wasn't the case sort of at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think this information would have been really important to have. So, um, so just kind of underlining the need to think about vulnerable groups, including um, people with disabilities um, in a crisis. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about is um, not just kind of the need to remember um, vulnerable groups when it comes to data, but also to remember um, people with disabilities when we make definitions, um, for example, about um, sort of around defining essential services, right? What is an essential service to the general population? Um, and that recognizing that that might not be the same for um, people with disabilities. What's not necessarily an essential service for um, the general population might very well be an essential service for someone with um, a disability. And taking that into account when we make policies is critical um, for the well-being of people um, with disabilities during pandemics. So this includes, for example, um, yes, yeah, so <coughs> excuse me. Um, so a personal example is um, that I, for example, access physio, um, physiotherapy regularly for um, my cerebral palsy. And at the beginning of the pandemic, those were all closed. So the centers I used to go to for that were all closed and it was deemed to be non-essential, but for me, it very much is essential. So that's just an example of um, sort of keeping um, these things in mind when we define uh, what is an essential services and, uh, service and, and what is not. Um, so this is again why it's so important to bring in people with, with lived experience when we, um, when we make these decisions. Um, and so lastly, I'd also just like to kind of um, bring in some of the other perspectives of people um, on the National Youth Advisory uh, Panel of Child Rights. So these um, include young adults with um, brain-based disabilities, including cerebral palsy, but also other disabilities such as autism. Um, and they shared some of their thoughts with me as I was um, telling them about this meeting. So, um, and some of them have been positive. So I, I guess I'll just share some positive um, perspectives to, <coughs> to finish on a positive note. So, um, so first of all, um, someone with um, cerebral palsy mentioned that due to their um, mobility limitations, they actually found uh, remote medical care and remote learning to be um, very accessible for them. So they said that that was um, an interesting change during the pandemic. However, I also want to underline that this will not be the case for everyone. Um, as Krista has, has also brought up, um, barriers in terms of access to um, the internet. Um, so it just underlining that we need to be careful when and not sort of make blanket um, investments in any particular thing or blanket policies, but really looking at individual needs and respecting um, those needs in order to ensure good outcomes um, for people with different types of disabilities and different severity of disabilities. 
Um, yeah, so just to summarize, I think it's the, the key message is to um, take into account uh, vulnerable groups and people with disabilities in data, in policymaking, and in definitions, for example, definitions of essential services. Um, and so I think in order to do this, we really need to focus on the lived um, the experiences and perspectives of um, people with disabilities. So I think it's great that this has been done here and that I got the chance to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps now uh, we can switch to Victor. If we can put Victor on screen. Hello. Hello, Victor. Okay, How are you guys. We're very well. We've had a good discussion, as you've heard. Um, may I just may I just say one thing? I just uh, want to thank all the participants who spoke. That was very brave of you speaking and very good remembering on the point you were trying to make. That was really amazing. So thank you to all the participants who spoke. That was really amazing. You guys did a wonderful job. And Victor, did you have some things that you wanted to put forward? Yes, thank you very much. So I'm gonna speak right now, okay guys? Good. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities need support with their mental health and need people to talk to. This pandemic has worsened symptoms for many of us. People are feeling alone and scared. With this pandemic, it feels like the world has been put on pause and we don't know when it's going to start back up again. Because I don't think you know this, it really impacted self-advocates. All of a sudden, our programs have stopped. Even when some things opening up again, I am still afraid of meeting people because I might catch COVID. And this is a very high risk for me because I have something called asthma and I and I am a very high risk of catching COVID. This pandemic has put life in perspective of how a really good support system can make or break you. We need the government to support us during this time of crisis and beyond. You should be able to support everyone. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities are being discriminated against. We need more resources to help support self-advocates with their mental health at this time. It is important for all some advocates to have the technology needed to meet online and keep doing the activities we enjoy. People with IDD need a clear and accessible communication from the government so we can be informed and make the right decisions to keep ourselves safe and well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, I think we may have a couple of minutes for any other comments by the panel. Anyone? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Wait. Yes. That's, and that's I think if I could, right? that's, that's right. Okay. No, good, Victor. I think that um, that you made some very good points. And the if I could summarize some of the issues is, is that we have the data now. We don't have enough data, but we have enough data to show 
that people with IDD have been grossly and unfairly discriminated against during the pandemic, that it's now our responsibility to move this forward, to, to ensure that the proper and appropriate, not asking for anything more than anyone else, it just needs to be that people with IDD are able to participate fully in the Canadian life. Um, and the, uh, the data is clear. It's time to be counted. It's time for people with IDD, their caregivers, their families to have the access, to have the opportunities that the rest of us in Canada have. And I think it's clear from the discussion today and the policy documents that we've developed that this is indeed and should be a priority of the Canadian people. It's not a matter of anything more than justice and fair play. And that's what Canada is all about. Uh, other comments from the panel? If not, perhaps we can wrap up now and thank everyone for coming today. Thank all of the panel members uh, who've been very articulate and conveyed the, the issues that were presented in the report and issues that have come out of the report. Thank you very much.